Thank you all for being on the call this evening. Uh, as you know, uh, this is Representative Steve Sutherland. Uh, it is a great honor to, uh, to have a little while to be able to, to visit with you in the comforts of your home. Uh, I, if we have called during an inconvenient time, I, I apologize up front. Uh, that is certainly not our intent. Uh, it is only our desire to, to hear back from, from those we are honored to represent. Uh, on issues that, that our country faces right now and issues that affect Florida's 2nd Congressional District. Uh, I appreciate your visiting us uh, tonight uh, through the Teletown Hall. Uh, tonight we are calling once again uh, from our office uh, in the Longworth House Office Building here in Washington, uh, and we are, are pleased that um, this is our 20th Teletown Hall meeting uh, that we have conducted, and so many of you have visited with us uh, in the past, and I just uh, thank you for, for once again giving us the opportunity. If you have never been on a Teletown Hall meeting, uh, it is a, a very uh, uh, interesting format. Uh, it's also convenient, uh, and if, if you want to uh, listen tonight only, uh, just, just uh, keep the phone uh, to your ear or even put it on, on speakerphone and and uh, for the next uh, little bit, just enjoy uh, the questions and the answers. Uh, if, if you want to ask a question tonight, uh, the process by asking a question would be to push star three uh, on, uh, on your dial, uh, on your keypad. And by pushing star three, uh, you'll be placed in the queue to ask a question. So if you want to ask a question, uh, I would invite you to push star three. Now, I'm going to continue to to kind of give you some introductory comments, because while I'm doing that, we're going to have uh, thousands and thousands of more individuals uh, join our call. So it takes a few minutes to get everyone on the phone. Uh, we call, uh, in, a, in a call like this, we call out around 150,000 uh, residents. Uh, we call uh, Republicans, Democrats, independents, no party affiliation. Uh, we we want to make sure and hear from all of our district, and so uh, if, if you are coming on to the call uh, and you want to ask a question tonight, please push star three uh, to get in the queue to ask a question. And in just a few moments, we will start um, fielding questions and then have a conversation. Also tonight, if you are interested in our e-newsletter, which every two weeks we send out an e-newsletter uh, to those uh, who are subscribing to that, uh, and, and subscription to that is totally free, but if you go into, um, you know, our, our website, uh, we will sign you up for our e-newsletter. If that's something you're interested in doing, then we would ask you to push star zero, star zero, to sign up for our e-newsletter. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, on a consistent basis that you are hearing of, of, of what we're doing here uh, in Washington to represent you, and we want to uh, to know. We want you to know uh, the actions, uh, the bills, perhaps uh, that we are uh, uh, dealing with, and the issues that we are trying to address uh, here on a, on a really on a consistent basis. So please sign up for our e-newsletter. We also uh, would would invite you to visit our website, Sutherland.house.gov. Sutherland.house.gov. Uh, it is a wonderful resource that people can go to. Uh, if you want to know about our locations uh, in Panama City, Tallahassee, also here in uh, Washington, D.C., uh, if you have any, uh, any, any needs uh, with a, with a uh, federal department uh, or a federal uh, program, uh, then, then we, are stand, you know, we will stand uh, ready to help you and assist you. So it gives you our phone numbers. It gives you the members of our staff. Uh, as we all stand here to, to help you. So sutherland.house.gov. Uh, again, for those who are just coming on the conversation, uh, we would ask if, uh, if you would, uh, uh, if you want to ask a question tonight, push star three, star three to get in the queue to ask a question. As I mentioned a few moments ago, we are here in, in, uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, for tonight's call. And uh, we, we're going to spend just a little bit of time with you this evening talking about some of the things that uh, we think we're doing. Uh, and, and we want to make sure that uh, you know about some important pieces of legislation uh, that we have uh, introduced. Last week, 
as a matter of fact, we introduced the Regulatory Overreach Protection Act, H.R. 5078. Uh, and what this act does is it, it, it prohibits uh, the EPA from expanding its regulatory authority to include almost any body of water in America, uh, such as ditches, pipes, watersheds, farmland ponds, even uh, ruts in a road uh, that, uh, uh, that collects water. Uh, there are just certain things that I think uh, EPA uh, you know, does not need to, uh, to, to be involved in. And, 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 and so what this, uh, what this act does, uh, it's a bipartisan piece of legislation. It is co-sponsored by Republicans and Democrats uh, here in Congress. Uh, but uh, this would stop this unprecedented federal power grab that was announced by the EPA and the Corps of Engineers. Uh, it would ensure that our farmers, our manufacturers, our transportation builders, and our construction industries are not crushed by really Washington regulations that could hurt North and Northwest Florida's economy and obviously killing jobs. But make no mistake, uh, this bill does not roll back uh, important reg regulations that are currently in place. It's just a common sense approach uh, that, that really, uh, you know, makes sure that the states continue to have say uh, in our own waters and how they will be managed by ensuring that this balanced federal and state partnership remains in place. Our legislation uh, is just building up a tremendous uh, success uh, and, I, and I think that uh, it, it, it basically keeps the Clean Water Act um, uh, in place to where it does not uh, continue to harm uh, our uh, economy. So, you know, we're, we're going to continue to talk about that tonight. And also another act, uh, a piece of legislation that we introduced was the MAST Act. The MAST Act uh, is the Marine Access and State Transparency Act. It is H.R. 4988. This legislation is in response to the president's plan to shut uh, off 780,000 square miles of ocean uh, from fishing and energy exploration uh, in the Pacific Ocean, an area larger than Florida, Texas, and Alaska combined. The MAST Act would require uh, such actions be first approved by Congress or any bordering state, such as their governor, and their legislature before anything like that can, can occur. Now, tonight, during the call, uh, we're going to ask a, a poll question. And here's what we want to hear. Uh, if you approve of the president's handling of the immigration crisis on the border, so if you approve of the president's handling of the immigration crisis on the border, we're going to ask you to push one for yes. Yes, I agree with the president and how uh, the border crisis is currently being handled. If you disagree and you think uh, uh, that, uh, uh, you know, the answer is no, we would ask you to push uh, two, two for no, and then three if you're unsure. Uh, so one for yes, two for no, three if you're unsure. Do you approve of the president's handling of the immigration crisis on the border? One for yes, two for no, three for unsure. So uh, it looks like we've got uh, a couple thousand uh, attendees on our call tonight. Uh, we're going to go first to um, Mr. Scott. Uh, uh, is this Mr. Scott? Uh, yes, sir. Hi, Mr. Scott. Thank you for being on the call tonight. Yeah, thank you so much. And I can't tell you how much I really appreciate your great uh, uh, conversations with your clients uh, and communications. Well, thank you. It's a it's a real privilege to uh, to have a conversation like this. And again, we, we certainly don't want to interrupt people's dinner or or uh, their family time. Uh, our desire is only to keep you connected to what we're doing. So, thank you. I appreciate you being on the call. Uh, your staff is amazing. The responses to emails, uh, I'm thoroughly impressed. Well, and thank, you. thank you very much. Supported you early on. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I, I appreciate uh, I appreciate uh, your kind words, and I'll certainly pass that along to our team. Um, do you got Do you have a question tonight? You want to ask for uh, for the group that's on uh, on the call? Uh, yes, sir. The first one that I really had had to deal with the aspect of negative campaign ads that we're seeing uh, that have no substance, and and that but your your staffers say you can't discuss that. The other one, the other question that I have has to deal with the aspect of uh, medical marijuana and the prohibition against marijuana and, and your views on that for where 
the state is going and and the nation. Well, as you know, we've we've uh, we're seeing states from around the country uh, that uh, are are you know having referendums on uh, on their ballots uh, to legalize marijuana. Uh, we've noticed that uh, uh, Colorado, for probably the most high profile um, uh, vote uh, that occurred. You know, I think I think my you know, personally, uh, I am not a fan of of uh, of marijuana. I think that it's a, I think that it is dangerous. I think that it is a uh, it is really a gateway drug, and I think that uh, it, it we got to be um, got to be sensible here. I, I think uh, so. I'm I'm I, personally, uh, I am not uh, uh, agreeing that that marijuana should be legalized. Uh, I think it uh, it can have a uh, a devastating impact on the lives, especially of young people uh, who are are really um, susceptible and vulnerable. So, uh, but uh, I appreciate uh, that call. I thank you for for. Uh, uh, but let me say this: back to the. But before I go to uh, announcing uh, our our poll, uh, it is going to be a referendum issue. So, to all the voters that are on the call tonight, you know that it is going to be uh, something that will be on our ballot in November. Uh, and I think it's important for the people to let their wishes be known. Uh, I think that uh, that is a good thing. Uh, so it is something you're going to hear more of. And by the way, uh, I, I want to thank uh, Mr. Scott for his comments. You know, tonight we're calling from our congressional offices, and uh, we're not allowed to have conversations regarding you know campaigns uh, because that is. Uh, uh, so I appreciate him mentioning that. Uh, if you're on the call tonight, if you didn't hear a few moments ago, if you want to ask a question, please push star three, star three to ask a question tonight to get in the queue. And to sign up for our e-newsletters, please push star zero, uh, and you will get a newsletter every two weeks from us. Um, tonight's poll question is, do you approve of the president's handling of the immigration crisis on the border? If you agree with the way the president has handled this crisis, we would invite you to push uh one on your keypad for yes. Uh, if you disagree and you, you're not uh, in favor of what the president has done or approve of what the president has done or how he's handled the crisis, uh, push two for no. And then three if you're unsure. Three if you're unsure. Now we're going to keep moving around for questions. We've got uh, Ellison in uh, Tallahassee. Ellison, are you on the call? Yes, I'm here. Hi, Ellison. Thank you for being on the call this evening. Hi to you, uh, Congressman. My question is, uh, the Veterans Administration uh, responds to claims in the appeal process. Yes, sir. However, the documents that they send out uh, advising the veteran of their decision is so complicated until it takes a, a lawyer to understand what mm -hmm. they're saying and what they need from that veteran. The language needs to be uh, simplified and explained thoroughly to the veteran because most of the veterans receive that information and they throw it in the corner because they can't understand it. Right. Now, now I happen to be, I'm a 100% I'm a disabled veteran, but it okay. took me nine years to do that. Wow. Can I ask and a so, question? Uh, you know, I'm just concerned about the language that they send out, and I mean, I cannot monopolize the call by reading the language to you, because it's too detailed and too um, uh, uh, difficult to understand to the layperson. Right. Well, let me ask you this. Uh, I yeah. would welcome an opportunity to learn more about how confusing that is. W w would it be possible uh, for uh, for us to... Uh, to, to speak with you uh, offline, uh, basically not on the call tonight because it, it may take more time than. But, but I want to hear uh, some of your your real life experiences of that confusion uh, and that challenge because I find sometimes that uh, and I'm, everybody on the call I think can agree that oftentimes when you're given a form. Uh, it, it just makes matters worse. You, you just can't it navigate does. through it. So I know we've got we have uh, we have your information, uh, your your obviously your name and your phone number. Uh, I would only do so you know with your permission. Uh, would it be possible for us to have uh, one of our our team members reach out to you to try to learn more about some of the challenges that you've had? Certainly. 
Okay, well, we'll do that. But let me agree with you in that uh, with 80,000 veterans in Florida's 2nd Congressional District, uh, I have been uh, upset. I have been angry. I have been really confused as to why uh, the Veterans Administration uh, has not done what I believe its mission is, and that is to provide quality health care to our veterans. And part of quality, uh, Ellison, is speed. Uh, And so, therefore, when our veterans serve, uh, obviously they should receive the services that they expect, services that they have been promised, and part of quality is speed. So some of the waiting lists, uh, the stories we've heard, totally unacceptable. Uh, And we have been very active in communicating with the president. Um, uh, And and I think that veterans, uh, if you are on a waiting list, I believe you should have the opportunity and the option to opt out uh, to go to a private uh, health care provider uh, until we get these waiting lists uh, uh, diminished to where all veterans, all veterans uh, are receiving the services that they need and deserve uh, with the VA. So uh, thank you for the call, and we will be in touch, Ellison, um, uh, here in the next day. Uh, probably tomorrow uh, we'll make sure that we call you uh, and, and learn more about your situation. Now we're going to go to uh, Joe. Joe, are you on the call? Uh, yes. Hi, Joe. Thank you for being on the call. I think you're on the west side of our district uh, over in Panama City Beach. Yes, sir. Thank you for being on the call tonight. Oh, you're welcome. My question is, uh, we went on a charter out of Destin July 2nd. When we booked that charter, Red snapper season was in play. When we got there on the 2nd of July, the captain had to inform us that the FWC closed the red snapper season. And while we were out on the charter, we caught quite a few red snapper and nice ones and it was a shame to throw them back and watch them die floating on the water why why does the fwc it seems like the they like to play games with this red snapper deal well, let me let me state uh, uh, one. Let me state something that some people may not be aware of. Uh, the red snapper, uh, as as you know, are are the, the oversight for the red snapper uh, is uh, really conducted mainly through the Secretary of Commerce uh, and under the Secretary of Commerce, who is appointed, obviously uh, selected by the president. Uh, under the Secretary of Commerce and the Commerce Department, NOAA and the National Marine Fisheries, uh, and the Gulf Council. The Gulf Council, uh, which is made up of representatives from uh, each of the five Gulf Coast states, those, uh, those bodies uh, regulate red snapper in federal waters. And up to this point, have been providing all of the data uh, to, uh, to, to, to determine the management practices uh, as it relates to the red snapper. Now, as... As a member of the Fisheries Subcommittee uh, on Natural Resources Committee, I have had a front row seat for almost four years now uh, in really challenging uh, the Gulf Council and the National Marine Fisheries on the data that I know to be um, uh, wrong and incorrect. Uh, Sir, you noted that you went out and you caught snapper. Well, I am a fisherman. Growing up in Panama City, my family fishes, and I'm, I'm telling you that we have never caught larger red snapper and more red snapper. And what is a shame is when you bring a snapper up and you have to let it go, uh, obviously the dolphins are waiting to, uh, to eat that snapper. So you're doing greater harm to the stock. And um, I just I know that the red snapper are, are not being overfished, but the quota, the arbitrarily low set quota by the National Marine Fisheries is what is being overfished. So it's a low quota. Uh, it is not It is not the red fisheries, uh, I mean the red snapper itself. So 
I will say this, that you notice in response to the federal regulations, something interesting has occurred. All five of the Gulf Coast states, Florida, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, and Texas, have said to the federal government that we've had enough. This is crazy. It is harming our local economies. Um, and, and they have expressed their anger uh, at uh, what the administration is doing uh, regarding fisheries. And so the state uh, of, of each of the state agencies have basically gone non-compliant. So this year, we had a 54-day red snapper season in state waters. So if you, were, if you had to let the snapper go on your fishing trip, um, that was only the case in federal waters, not in state waters. The federal government is shutting, doing everything it can to shut down the Gulf waters to red snapper, and they're already talking about a six-day season for next year. Uh, this year we had nine days, the first nine days of June. Uh, and I'll tell you, I, the, the red snapper have never been more plentiful, and again, the red snapper fishery is not overfished. But in state waters, uh, the state has kind of just said we've had enough. And uh, we had a 54-day uh, uh, inside the nine-mile mark uh, for the state of Florida. So all the states are now doing that. Uh, Louisiana, Texas, uh, year-round snapper fishing in state waters there. So uh, I agree with you. I share your aggravation. And as a fisherman, um, I see the damage to our charter boat industry, and I also see the damage to uh, the commercial industry. Uh, and it's such an important part of our legacy and our heritage in the state of Florida. It's jobs. Uh, it's the economy, and uh, so uh, we're fighting that fight on your behalf uh, to make sure that the federal government does not encroach uh, and turn the Gulf of Mexico into an aquarium, and that's basically what we see uh, the effort uh, underway. Now, we're going to continue to uh, to go back over to the east side of the district. We're going to talk to Barbara. Barbara, are you uh, on the call? I think you're over in uh, Jefferson County. Yes, I am. Hi. You're not going to like my call. Because oh, well, Barbara, that's I will, okay. <laughs> I will call you out on certain points. Number one, Good. red snapper, if you continued to fish the way it was being fished, you wouldn't have any fish to get. And this has been proven in other fisheries along the East Coast. Cod fishing, for instance, off the Great Banks. There aren't any cod left. They're finally getting to a point where they can go out and catch some cod. But you can't go out and do the heavy fishing that was being done. And this is something that happens in the Gulf of Mexico. The redfish were way down in numbers. And if it were closed for nine days, that's probably during their mating season. It's not good to catch fish when they're trying to procreate, because if you do, you aren't going to have any little fish. Barbara? And it, it, yeah, and if you go out, and we're talking, about, and the Pacific, you don't, you're not going to go for energy out in the middle, and that is the middle of the Pacific Ocean. It's not, it's not a Great Barrier Reef type thing. It is deep water. Right. And so I'm like, I, I just want to get this straight. So you are in favor of the president expanding uh, the sanctuary in the Pacific. By nearly a million square miles, without any that's authority million. from Congress. I'm just curious. I'm just. That's just a question. Yeah, but it's a million square miles of nothing. Now wait a minute. I'm just. I'm asking. Or I just want to make sure that I yes, understand. I am. So you're in favor of the president yes. having such authority with no accountability or no questioning from anyone? I'm in favor of what he did. No, he hasn't done it yet. He, he hasn't done it yet. On June okay. 12th, he made a public statement that his intentions are to expand a Pacific sanctuary by 780,000 square miles. So I just if want to make I, sure you're yeah, in favor of that. If I remember correctly, President Bush was the one who created the original marine sanctuary. That is correct. That so, is correct. My point is this. No president, no president, whether it's a Republican president or a Democrat president, no president. And my piece of legislation says that no president can act unilaterally such as that, whether Bush did it or a Democrat is now proposing to expand that by almost nine times, that no president should have that much authority without the permission of Congress. 
And, and if it borders a state, I mean, if it, it's within 100 miles, nautical miles of a state, that the state also gets to weigh in, that the governor and the legislature no. What I'm saying is Congress, currently, Congress is not being able to weigh in on the president's decision, and I think that that is wrong. Okay, we're going to keep moving, but I want to say this about the Red Snapper. Red Snapper, look, we used to have a 190-day season. We, we were now whittled down to... A couple years ago, we had a 40-day season. Then we had a 28-day season. Then we had a 11-day season. They cut that to nine, and now they're talking about six. So as a fisherman and as someone who knows uh, uh, you know, how to fish and fishes quite often, uh, I'm just saying that the, the facts are the red snapper is not overfished. And, so, and if you fish, like the gentleman who called earlier, uh, you know uh, the truth that uh, the red snapper are certainly plentiful, uh, and the stock has, in fact, and by the way, the National Marine Fisheries agrees. They have had a public statements agreeing that the red snapper uh, has, has been rebuilt. So, um, but look, at that, that, I appreciate Barbara's call and, and calling me out with the facts as she sees them. Uh, and as I noted before, we call Democrats, we call Republicans, we call independents, we call people that agree with us and people that don't. So uh, I appreciate her being on the call this evening. We're now going to go to Sneed, and we've got Oscar. Oscar, are you in? Uh, are you on the call? Yeah. Hi, Oscar. Look, I called y'all office today. Okay. And the consensus in my area is... We have got the most disengaged president that I've ever seen in my 68 years. He's always on vacation or playing pool or shooting, playing golf. And if the Congress don't close the purse on him and quit giving him money, and what he going to take this $3.7 million dollars billion dollars for is health care for and family services for these illegal young and I, I feel sorry for the young and my heart too and but he and this he is trying to change the democratic and the voting he's already already got it changed in California he's going out of Texas if he can change that and they get you your and another state, the Republicans, you'll have a one party system in a republic. Oscar, may I ask you a question? I mean, you're, you're bringing up uh, you're bringing up the issue uh, on the border right now, and I, I want to remind everyone on the call tonight that that uh, you know our, we have a poll question this evening, and the poll question is: Do you approve of the president's handling of the immigration crisis on the border? Uh, if you agree, press 1. If you disagree, uh, press 2 for no. And then 3 if you're unsure. So, well, I, uh, I voted no. Well, I, 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 I haven't handled nothing yet since he's been in office. Well, I, I, appreciate, uh, I appreciate your call. And let me address the president's request. Uh, we were told weeks uh, leading up to... Uh, two weeks at least, leading up to the president's request uh, that he would request somewhere in the neighborhood of $2 billion. Uh, we were flabbergasted uh, when we arrived uh, this past week, and the president actually uh, increased that uh, almost, uh, uh, almost uh, 100% and asked for uh, $3.7 billion. Uh, and by the way, none of that goes to really address uh, the proper sealing of the border uh, which everywhere I go in Florida's 2nd Congressional District, the 14 counties, um, people are, are frustrated uh, that uh, we have people coming over our border. We don't know who they are. We don't know where they're going. We don't know what they will do there. And uh, it is a basic requirement, I think, of Congress to provide and for the federal government uh, to provide for the security of its people. So um, I, I want to, but I want to hear from all of you. And so please go on to the poll question tonight. Uh, and participate so we can have uh, your feedback. Thank you so much, Oscar, for, uh, for the call. We're going to go to uh, uh, Stop Choppy now. We're going to go to Joe and Stop Choppy. Are you on the call? This is Joe Sellers. Hi, Joe. Thank you uh, for being on the call tonight. Yeah, uh, I appreciate it. And I, I do 
not approve of the president's way of handling the border? No. But my question is, concerning a boat ramp on Highway 375, that Pine Creek boat ramp, and the forestry department closed it, and we can't get it reopened. Well, I tell you what. Uh, I tell you what I can do. I know that uh, uh, I, I think you're represented uh, by you by Representative Halsey Brashears, uh, and what I would negative, like to, negative. No, no, you're, you're that oh, state. Oh, you're. So you're talking about. Uh, so you're talking about a federal. Um, yes, it's in the Apalachicola National Forest. So you're saying, oh, it's uh, so on. Uh, oh, it's State Road 375. I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. Well, I tell you what we can do. If um, uh, I thought I'm, I misunderstood you, I thought you said that the state closed uh, the ramp. No, no. Okay. The state didn't. Okay. I'm sorry. I thought you said the state closed the ramp. So, so the uh, so the the the, uh, the forestry service there, uh, uh, the park service there, closed the ramp. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And that is under our purview. So uh, what I what we could do, Joe, uh, and I'm happy to do this, can uh, uh, can we call you tomorrow? I certainly, as I told the caller earlier, who wanted uh, uh, some uh, information from us and we wanted to get some information from him, I certainly did, wouldn't do this without your permission. So uh, we've got your number here, obviously, uh, in Sop Choppy. Could we give you a call uh, tomorrow to discuss this and, and, and learn more? Uh, about this so we can take the necessary uh, uh, steps to make sure that the boat ramp is open. I mean, we, we uh, as, a, as an outdoorsman myself and, and as someone who loves the outdoors with my family and friends, uh, we certainly want to, uh, to uh, look into that. I would call, appreciate can call, so, can, so, so can we call you tomorrow? At any time your heart desires. <laughs> well, very good. I'm all for opening this ramp. We had to go without it for the 4th of July weekend. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. And the uh, boaters and the fishermen and all of our recreational personnel and everything, they were refused the opportunity to use that facilities, you know, because what it is... It's a concrete ramp, and the current has undermined the northern portion of it, but the southern portion is still open okay. or operable. Okay. And well, they had posts there for a barrier, and it, the current washed the post away, and it made the, I don't know, it made them mad or whatever, and they closed the entire landing. Well, we will. Um, uh, I, I will. Uh, we'll call you tomorrow uh, if that's okay, and we'll call you during uh, daytime hours. Uh, uh, you know, so after nine o'clock, we'll call you, uh, and and we'll we'll you know learn more about this, and we will certainly inquire uh, with the Park Service uh, as to why uh, this has been closed and to how it can be remedied so that it can be used uh, by our visitors and our citizens there. Joe, thank you so much for. Uh, for the call. Thank you for being on, and we look forward to talking to you tomorrow. Uh, we're now going to talk to um, Michael. Michael from Tallahassee? Yes, sir. Hey, Michael. Thank you for being on the call. Well, thank you for your time, too, as well, sir. Um, got a question. I tuned in late about the uh, EPA thing, and I think it's great that somebody is doing something about it, at least uh, to kind of freeze it in its tracks, but I'm wondering about uh, a possible rollback on some of the regulations. For example, when a property owner loses the use of their land because it's considered a wetland or something, their property's devalued and there's no eminent domain payment or there's no tax break either. You still have to pay taxes on that land is when you bought it. Um, I'm just wondering if there you can take it to the next level and say, hey, this is this is already extreme and they're able to get into your bank account or garnish your paycheck or something I heard today to like deduct money from you once you get fined. Well, I have not. Uh, I, I, I have not heard that. I, I know that our bill, uh, the one that, uh, that 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 we have uh, introduced, uh, deals with uh, the EPA's announcement uh, that they have uh, that they're going to expand uh, the Clean Water Act. And so, uh, currently, the Clean Water Act uh, deals with you know uh, navigable waters. 
uh, and we're talking about pond, you know lakes and ponds, and we're we're talking about uh, estuaries and rivers, and and so what we're trying to do is we're trying to say uh, that, that that there needs to be common sense, and we believe that this uh, the legislation uh, that that we have uh, filed, and by the way, that's going to be marked up uh, in committee which is a bipartisan effort, that our piece of legislation, uh, the Waters of the United States Regulatory Overreach Protection Act, deals with that rule as proposed by the EPA and the Corps of Engineers. Now, to your concerns, obviously when they have ruled arbitrarily uh, in a way that devalues uh, your property uh, in a way that uh, negatively impacts you, uh, I certainly think there needs to be roll pa- rollback. I think that the EPA has proven over and over again um, that it wants more. Uh, it, two years ago, the state of Florida successfully uh, uh, kept the EPA from increasing the numeric nutrient criteria uh, requirements that would have provided that would have mandated Florida meet a standard higher than all other 49 states, uh, and so. Uh, they have proven over and over again uh, their desire to expand their authority uh, without any oversight. So we're going to, we, that's why we've uh, introduced our bill. Uh, and I will tell you that I disagree with, uh, with much of what the EPA has done, especially if they've ruled on you in a way that has devalued your property. Uh, I think we should look at more rollback. So, um, you know, I, I, I think uh, I agree with you. So, uh, it, it, obviously, I believe in sensible regulation, uh, but unfortunately, we are seeing a department here in Washington uh, that knows no constraints. And so, uh, thank you for, for calling and uh, expressing uh, your concerns. We're going we're gonna to now talk to Sonia in uh, Jefferson County. Sonia? I'm here. Thank you for taking my call. Sure. Thank you. And uh, thank you for what you're doing. I do um, think you're doing a good job, and I hope that um, it all works out. But I do have a question about Common Core and um, what our state is going to do about it, because I, I've seen that other states are, are getting away from it, and I would hope that that's what we're going to do, but it seems like we still have it. So if you can give me some feedback on that, I'd appreciate sure. it. Sure. Uh, well, I, I, let me, let me uh, first of all, on education, I believe uh, – not just on education, but in so many things, I think that the states uh, should uh, should have their power uh, restored to have more say uh, over the direction that their state wants to go. And I think education is a is an example that the state of Florida, uh, the individual school districts, parents, and their involved, they should have more say rather than federal regulators uh, a thousand miles away from our district, uh, really who don't even go into our schools. And uh, so. Uh, we have uh, we passed last year uh, a bill out of the House uh, that would prevent uh, really Common Core from being utilized in a way that there were financial incentives for that state. So, so I, I I want you to know that 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 I am not in favor of Common Core. I have announced uh, openly my objection to it, uh, and so obviously the state of Florida. Uh, has to stand up, and that would be in Tallahassee. Uh, so that would be the governor and the state legislature, the Senate, the House. But uh, I have expressed my uh, disagreement with it. And as, and as you noted, uh, uh, Sonia, that other states, uh, other state governors, other state legislatures have announced uh, their rejection of it as well. So uh, each state, I think, should weigh in, and that is their right. But uh, I disagree with Common Core uh, and what it is attempting to do. Okay. So, so um, just to clarify, then, what is what is holding back our state from from getting this out of the our school system? Well, I, I think I think each state has to weigh in, uh, uh, and for our state, during uh, during the governor um, needs to weigh in, and I think uh, the state legislature needs to weigh in. So, uh, and by weigh in, you mean like? Uh, well, they they need to pass. They they need to they need to totally reject it. And I think you have seen other states say that they are not going to participate in Common Core, and they've made a definitive statement. And so I think what you're asking uh, is is fair. Uh, you want to know that your elected officials on a state level, um, uh, you know, represent you. 
Uh, and and so I think your expectation is fair. You want the governor. You want the uh, the, uh, the state education department uh, and our legislature. Uh, that we will not fund, we will not adopt, and we will not fund uh, Common Core curriculum in our Florida schools. So, um, you know, you, you've got your obviously your state senators, your your state representatives uh, that you certainly need to weigh in uh, with their offices to let them know your opinion. So, uh, but I share I share your concern. So, uh, thank you, Sonia, for being on the call this evening. Uh, we're going to talk to Bob in uh, Taylor County. Bob, are you on the call? Bob? Uh, Bob Root here. Hi. Uh, uh, there's a bill up there uh, in the House, I believe, to add 13 cents onto the uh, price of a gallon of gasoline uh, for the Federal Highway Administration. Also, this bill would index it according to inflation. Uh, your thoughts, please. Actually, the bill is in the Senate. Bob, it was a 12 cent um, uh, tax uh, that the American people would um, uh, would would experience, uh, and and I I, I look at uh, what the American people have had to endure over the last uh, six years. Uh, fuel prices have doubled, uh, while the the spending ability uh, of the family budget uh, has decreased. Uh, I, I think, and yet we just continue to prevent. Uh, you know, I think on federal lands, we continue to uh, to make sure that the, to not to not give the relief uh, to the American uh, uh, American household. And I, I so I am I am not in favor of uh, the twelve uh, that proposal, the twelve percent or twelve cent gas tax. I am not in favor of that. Uh, and by the way, that is not in the House. It is it was in the Senate, uh, and uh, it, it will not be. Uh, to, to, to my knowledge, it will not be heard in the House. You're, you're right. I forgot it was in the Senate. And how does the bill originate uh, in the Senate that has to do with funding? Well, and that's a good deal. Look, that's been an argument that uh, we have heard uh, uh, over and over and over again. So, uh, But in this particular case, we're not going to have to hear it. So uh, it, it, uh, will not, it will not happen. Uh, there, there, there is a problem, and I think you touched on it, uh, there is a problem with, uh, uh, with, with, with the transportation funding uh, because the, uh, the trust funds uh, do not meet the needs that we have uh, on repaving our roads and rebuilding our bridges. Uh, transit obviously uh, takes a lot of money and, and does not provide uh, uh, for its needs independently. I think if I would like to see the transportation dollars that are collected through our, our gas tax uh, be totally designated for uh, our roads and our bridges uh, and not be siphoned off. It affects Florida in a great way. We're a donor state. Uh, and so, you know, we do not collect a, a dollar back for every dollar that we send. Uh, so, you know, I, I, uh, but I do not believe the way to properly fund it is to increase taxes on the American people right now when our economy is clearly not doing what our economy has the potential of doing. So, uh, great question, uh, and I, I appreciate uh, interest in, uh, in our transportation funding. Um, James uh, from Chattahoochee. James, are you on the call? That'll be me, yes. Hi, Hi James. Thanks for being on the call tonight. Hi. Okay. Um, I'll start up by mentioning that uh, I'm an independent. Okay. And... Uh, I try to be as objective as I can about our government. And I want to know, are you familiar with the, the controversy surrounding Eric Holder's response to a question uh, recently about racism? Um, if, I, if I recall, uh, I recall the, the, uh, the Attorney General responded to a question, uh, it, but it was, I, I want to say it was, like a year ago in a... Uh... Oh, no, no, this is very recent. Uh, okay. Should... I'm not familiar with that. I'm sorry. Oh, well. Okay, well, I guess... Uh... Well, what did he say? Well, basically, uh, the question was, did he feel that uh, the discontent that was felt towards the government had a lot to do with racism, the fact that the president half black, et cetera. And his response was that no, he felt like that there was just a racial component, a small racial component that, that filtered in with some people. But in general, he just, you know, he, he felt like uh, 
it was just dis- overall discontentment. And the reason I, I called to ask to talk to you about it is because I, I've, I've seen Fox News and they were discussing it yesterday, hmm. and they were saying that he played the race card and that he was contributing to the divisiveness in this country. And also they, they mentioned that if, if the president were white and a Democrat, 